I want to employ your attention to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. Tonight we will be dealing with what do I owe the church? My fervent prayers and love. In John chapter 13, we find that our Lord had to rebuke yet again his disciples, his immediate disciples, those who will later become known as his ambassadors or apostles. And the reason being is this. They had a carnal mindset concerning the then coming kingdom. And those individuals were jockeying for position. Who would be the greatest, as it were, in the kingdom? And so you know the story if you read through the book of John, and I'm, certainly, I'm certain you have, that our Lord on that occasion washed the feet of his disciples. He washed their feet to teach them a lesson. But he said unto them as he, as he concluded his not only illustration, but his instructions as well. We will look at John 13, verse 34 and 35. He said, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Listen to what the Lord says. He says, as it were, when you demonstrate your love for each other, you are in essence teaching the world about New Testament Christianity. Now, brethren, some people say, I love you, I love you, I love you, and that's all that they do. They say it, but they don't demonstrate it. Now, if we love one another and what was going on, let me go ahead and progress a little further. The church at Corinth lacked in love. And he, the greatest chapter on love, of course, is 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And he said, these three, abide in these three. But he said, the greatest of these three is love. What does love do for us? And we certainly will deal with prayer because fervent prayers and fervent love go hand in hand. If I love you, that means that I'm going to pray for you. If you don't love me, I, I may never know, but you probably won't pray for me. But if you love me, you're going to pray for me because you know that prayer is one of the Christian's greatest allies. I heard someone say it, and sometimes I, I make a statement and sometimes I do not. They said, oh, they took prayer out of schools. God put prayer in the church and he put prayer in the individual Christian. He never put prayer in the schools. Who then has the right to pray? John 9, 31 still rings supreme. Only the righteous have the right and the privilege to pray. To pray. But here he says, love. If we have love one for another, the world will know that you are my disciples indeed. Let's turn over to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, and let's look at something there relative to love. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Here the Lord is speaking through the Apostle Paul to the church at Ephesus, and he says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. And he says, Walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling Savior. So he tells us then that we are to walk in love. And that term walk refers to the way we live. And so we are to conduct ourselves in such a way that people see the love that is in us. Now let's turn back to the book of Acts chapter 2. And let's look at some things in Acts chapter 2, Acts 3, 4, and even 5. And here in the book of Acts chapter 2. Now, some of these individuals, these 3,000 precious souls were added to the body of Christ. And they now make up the church at Jerusalem. And the Bible tells us that these individuals in verse 44, and all that believe were together. All that believe, that is then what? That is a trait of love. Now, do people who love each other, do they sometimes disagree with each other? I have a good friend of mine, I can't call his name, but he told me, he said, my wife and I have never argued. Now, this is a Christian telling me this. 
And to, it, I didn't even have a response. <laughs> they introduced this newly wed, wedded couple to me and they were, we pray for all of our couples and as they get to know one another, there are going to be some things she doesn't care to see him do and there are going to be some things he doesn't care to see that she does. But you know, that's part of the marital experience. Everything about my wife I don't like and everything about me she doesn't like and sometimes she tells me she doesn't like. You know what I have as a response to that? I don't have a response. <laughs> <laughs> Love is the most misunderstood principle even in the church. And I hate to say that because the Bible tells me if I love your soul, I'm going to snatch you out of the fire. If I love your soul, I am going to tell you what you need to hear when you need to hear it. If I love your soul, I am going to stand with the righteous if you are walking disorderly and I am going to withdraw myself from you and I am going to support the actions of the leadership because they are executing their duties as per the scriptures. And so some people, they have a problem with church discipline and they don't understand that church discipline is an act of love. And so when the church sadly has to withdraw itself from a brother or sister who's walking disorderly and who refuses to repent, they fail to see because sometimes they are hindered by their emotions or their attachment to. God says, I want you to withdraw from that brother or sister so that you may do what? Gain their attention. That they may miss the fellowship of the saints and they would want to come home. But sadly, a lot of brethren don't want to practice what God says. But we still must stand. Is that not right? We still must stand where God tells us to stand. When the Bible tells us that God is love, it's describing part of God's character. Love certainly originated and it emanates from God. And so when people quote John 3, 16, they need to quote it in its contextual setting. The Lord is trying to teach this man by the name of Nicodemus. And I'll always laugh. Uh, my mother's father, Harrison Grant Sr., he used to come to our house and sometimes he would come. He would have his Coca-Cola to the left and he would have his liquid spirits to the right. And... He used to call my brother Nicodemus, and I never knew why until I learned the scriptures. He used to call him Nicodemus. He'll take a sip here, and he'll take a sip here, and he'll start to sing this song that he never finished, entitled My Mother Told Me. And then he would scream out for Nicodemus. But when I learned who Nicodemus was, I began to laugh, and people didn't know why I was laughing. It took me 23 years to learn who Nicodemus was. And so Nicodemus came to the Lord. We know the story. But the Lord let it be known that you have to experience the new birth. And the new birth has been presented to us because of God's love. God has exhibited his love and God extends his love to us. And the Bible teaches us that it is indeed, as it were, a love letter. But the Lord wants us to know that if we love one another, the world needs to see it. Now, we don't go out and have, do these things because we want the world to see us. We do it because we love one another. As we are now in Acts chapter 2, the Bible says that they were, in verse 44 again, all that believed were together and had all things common. Verse 45, and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. Now, look at those verses. They were together. They were together in a spiritual sense. They were together because love brought them together. They responded to the love of God, which was extended in the end 
invitation in Acts chapter 2 and verse 40 and 41. The Bible tells us then those who had obeyed the gospel, they now had a new, they had a new direction in life. And they looked at their brothers and sisters in Christ, all of whom had obeyed the gospel. And here they are now. They so love each other, although the church is in its infancy stage, they love each other to the point that they are willing to look at the, each other's needs. Now, tell me how much you love me, but when I have need, I don't hear from you. Remember we talked about that stuff? How many sermons have we heard about the Good Samaritan? You know what's interesting about the Good Samaritan is that he didn't call up the elders and say, hey, you know, brother so-and-so is over the benevolent uh, ministry. There's somebody down here who needs help. Can you send him? He didn't do that, did he? He didn't do that. He took money out of his own pocket. See, he took money out of his own pocket and he showed love for a man whom he did not know. They had never met before, according to my understanding of the scripture. And the Bible is teaching us that love motivates you to do things. Love motivates you to get out of your shell, out of your comfort zone. And here are these individuals. Remember, initially they came to Jerusalem for to worship. They came as Jews and they left as Christians, some of them. But some of them stayed back in Jerusalem. And the Bible says they sold their possessions. They pooled their monies together and they made certain that their brethren had what they needed. Because that's what love does. That is exactly what love does. The Bible tells us as we turn over in our Bibles, in chapter 4, what took place in chapter 4? Well, chapter 3, we know the man was, he was healed miraculously. And that gave certain opportunities for the brethren to preach Peter then, and so they did. As we pick up in chapter 4, pick up in verse 40, 34 with me. And look what the Bible says about the church. Neither was there any among them, verse 34, that what? That lacked. For as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. Look at the love the church possessed in the first century. Look at the love the church possessed, the very first church of Christ established on the planet. Look how much love they had for each other. Now, no one twisted their arms and they weren't, they weren't coerced into doing this. That's what love does. Love looks beyond, it, beyond its own needs to take care of others. Let me slow down a little bit. Everyone in this audience has heard the word sacrifice, haven't you? Haven't you heard the word sacrifice? Sacrifice, sacrifice. Now we talk about it in theory, do we not? We talk about love in theory, and we talk about sacrifice in theory. Inherent in the word love is action. Oh baby, I love you, I love you. You can call me and tell me that a thousand times in a day. I love you. They said, well, what's wrong with that, brother? Grant? Really, there's nothing wrong with that. But love is there when you need love. Love is there. Now, brother, let me ask you something. People on the outside of the church, and I know some brethren, I can't call names, of course, but they are still very, very, very close to people on the outside after they've been in the church for many years. Now, if I understand Christianity and its nature, the closer I grow to God and to God's people, the closer, the closer I grow to the Lord and his people. You know what that's going to do for my relationship with people outside the church? You know what? It's going to cause, it's going to cause a, 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 a great gulf, if you will, to exist after a while. You know why? We don't share the same concerns. We don't have the same type of faith. Our goals in life are not the same. Now, I'm not telling you to abandon all the people you know who are, are not Christians, but I love to be around Christians. Don't, don't you love to be around Christians? 
There are things I can only get from Christians. Because a Christian who loves me, he or she will not allow me to call them or text them with gossip. Y'all pretty quiet out there. They will not allow me to speak reproachfully against the Lord's church. Because if you speak against the church, you're speaking against the Lord. And some people say, well, I can have a relationship with the Lord, but I, no, you cannot. You cannot. If you don't have a good relationship with the church, you don't have a good relationship with the Lord. There's things that only Christians can do for me. They can encourage me. They can rebuke me. They can correct me. They can do what? They can educate me in matters of which I am ignorant. That's what they can do. The world can't do that. And so if I love the church like the Lord loves the church, and this is why he said to us men, he said, husbands, love your wives even as I love the church. Why? Because that's what he wants. I prove my love to the Lord by the way I treat my spouse. I prove my love to the Lord by the way I treat my brethren. And so that means then, if I've been in this church for a number of years, I should know the names and where they live. The, of all the members of the church, that's not an elder's only duty. I don't have this little group that I hang out with all the time because I love the church. Did not the Bible say, does, does not the Bible say, brother, in Acts chapter 2, that those who believe they were together, I know what together means. Together means you are what? Together. <laughs> That's what it means. You are together. That means then that you have the same goals. You see life in the same way. That's what Christians, that's what Christians have. They have the same goals. They have the same vision. They have the same concern one for another. And so if I understand love, love will sacrifice when it has to sacrifice to help others. We often talk about agape love, don't we? And really, that's all we do. Let's be honest. We talk about agape love, but agape love means I am willing to sacrifice in order that you may have. That's what agape love means. I am willing to forego some things that you may have. I don't give you out of my abundance all of the time. This is why I refer to the Macedonians as the mighty Macedonians. Here they were, they were dirt poor, didn't have much, but they were rich in love. And they heard about brethren over on the other side of the world, as it were, who, uh, who, who, who were over in Judea or Palestine. They had need. They had never met these brethren, but they had a connection with them because of the love of God in their heart. Show me a church that loves it. Each member loves the way he or she should. And that's a mighty, powerful church. Because if you are hurting, I am hurting. If you are joyful, I am joyful. When sister and brother so-and-so, if they have a, a precious babe, it's a reason for all of us to rejoice. Why is that? Because we are connected through love. And the Lord said the greatest of these is love. So what does love do for me? I've already stated. Love will correct me when I need to be corrected. Love will encourage me when I'm downtrodden. Love will sit with me. And love may not say anything to me. In my darkest hours, love may just come and visit and sit with me. He or she doesn't have to say anything. Sometimes, you know, we try to go and console people. We just mess it all up by talking. We mess it up by just talking. Oh, but sometimes these people don't need you to say anything. You know, Job's friends were at their best when they said nothing. They were at their best when they said nothing. All they did was add it to that man's misery. So sometimes brethren saying nothing. You can send a little card. You can actually send a text. Say, Brother, sister, I'm praying for you. I'm thinking of you. I tell people, I say, I didn't hear the word love being used too much in my house when I grew up, but I knew I was loved. 
I absolutely knew that I was loved. Based on the treatment I received, we were treated like human beings. We were told things that would keep us out of trouble if we listened. We provided things, our needs, not all of our wants. But I knew I was loved. There wasn't one day I didn't feel like I was loved. And what does God want? What does he want from his children? Some of us have sent our children off to school and they get over there and they, they kind of lose their mind. They lost the phone, them at home. They don't, now they know when to call, when, they, when their bank account is low, they can call them, but otherwise they don't pick up the phone and say, hey, I just called to say, hello. Our Father in heaven, he wants to hear from us, doesn't he? He really wants to hear from us. Let's go over to 1 Peter before we finish up on, on love. We are to walk in love. We are to demonstrate our love. 1 Peter, look what he says in 1 Peter. Let's go over to 1 Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter two, chapter one, I'm sorry. First Peter chapter one and verse 22. Now look what he tells us. He says, seeing you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart. Look at the adverb. He says, love how? fervently. Look what he's telling us. When you think of fervency, the word fervent, what do you think of? Something that is, what, kind of, as it were, heated, if you will. Some of us, we, somebody, I can't remember who it was, they showed me a, a a debit card or a Visa card and it had a, you know, University of Alabama logo on it. Now, if you're a Christian, you wouldn't have that, but. <laughs> I learned that of all of the states in the South who really have a fervent love for football, I believe Alabama out, outdoes everyone. And they get there. You know, there's a radio show that comes on in Alabama, and it's on every week, even during the off season. Those people still call in, and they're going at it, man. They literally just go crazy over football. Uh, you will be hard pressed to say in Alabama it's just football. You may not make it out of their life. But he said we ought to have a fervent love for one another. Then he also described the love as being unfeigned, without hypocrisy. So he's saying we ought to have pure love for one another. And it's almost like, you know, when that precious baby comes into the world, how everybody just loves that precious baby and everyone wants to do for that precious baby and mom and daddy wants to do for it and grandmama and grand, everybody wants to do for that baby. They have that pure love for that baby. God says you need to have that same type of love for your brother. How can I love you if I haven't got the chance to know you? Or I hadn't made the, the time to get to know you. All we are are individuals who show up in the same place a couple of hours out of the week. That's all we do. Someone can mention a brother to us and say, well, what congregation he's a member of? Yeah. He's in. Now, love was on display as well in Acts chapter 6. Remember when the, the Grecians... They made a complaint because their widows were being neglected in the daily administration. And you saw how the leadership stepped up and addressed the issue and addressed the issue quickly. And they said it is not reasonable. It's not proper for us to break away from the priority of preaching and studying the word of God. And so they asked the congregation to come together as a unit and choose from among you seven men. And they gave these qualifications to say these men must meet these qualifications and let them oversee, as it were, this business. And the Bible says the instructions they received, the, the congregation, pleased everyone. And you know why everyone was pleased? 
because they had the same mindset. Now, there are brethren in the church, if they don't have their way, they want to leave. I'm going to get out of here and leave. They won't. Brethren, I've heard of congregations. I can't call the name. They got pews in the congregation that are two different colors. You know why? Brethren couldn't come together. Brother A wanted things his way and Brother B wanted things his way. And he, like Korah, he formed a coalition and he formed a coalition. And this, you know what you call that? If you were pursuing your doctorate degree and you were doing research and you came upon that scene or that scenario, you know what you'll call that? Stupid. <laughs> because that's what that is. You will split the church over the color of a pew. And you know what's sad? Those ones who wanted things their way, guess what side they sat on every Sunday? They sat on that side. And the others sat on that side. But it goes back to John 13, 34. He said, how would men know that you are my disciples indeed? How? You have love one for another. In Acts chapter 6, what happened? The church came together in a unified way and they selected seven men. Men of faith. And you see what happened? The problem, the problem went away. You know why? Love won out. But love can't win out if I got to have things my way, my way, my way all the time. Love never love compromises on things that are just matters of expediency. Hmm. It was on the local news one Sunday evening. Someone had called that local affiliate to come and see what was going on at a quote Church of Christ. They too were involved in a building program and two deacons had disagreed over matters relative to the building program. This thing escalated to the point that these two men were out on the front lawn of the church building engaged in fisticuffs and there it was on the local news for all to see. How are you going to convince people that you need to come and be a part of the body of Christ that meet there, that meets there rather, if you can't even solve matters that really don't really matter at times? But churches have split over, not over doctrine, over personalities and over likes and dislikes. You get to know me long enough, I can guarantee you're going to find some things about me you don't care for. If I get to know you, I guarantee you, I'm going to learn that there's parts of your character that I don't really care for. But this is what we must conclude. Your good will always outweigh your bad. When the Lord looks at us, he looks at people who are flawed, who are what? Who are frail, who are going to make some poor choices from time to time. From time, to time. But does he give up on us? No, ma'am and no, sir. Does his love grow weak toward us? No, ma'am. No, sir. So, brethren, how are y'all going to keep this church moving in the right direction? You must possess the proper type of love for each other. James chapter 5. James chapter 5. Turn there with me. In verse 16. He says, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. And he says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. I am to have fervent love for you and I'm also to have a fervent, effectual or effective life, lifestyle of prayer. We've heard all of the the, 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 the matters related to prayer, there's the privilege of prayer. Only the Christians enjoy the privilege of prayer. Your priority that you are to have in prayer, 
pattern of prayer, the persistence of prayer, all those things we've heard before. But I'm going to close out to the Old Testament. And I thought about this one particular verse in Psalm, in the book of Psalms. Look what he says in Psalm 40. Here was a man, he was in trouble. It's a Psalm of David, Psalm 40. The Bible tells us David was in a situation that was way beyond his control. He said, I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. Look what David said. He said, I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. The way this thing is pictured is, is, is like this. The God who keeps everything in its proper place. The God who provides for the sparrow. The God who takes care of every creature on this planet. Who keeps the planets and the universe in order. It's the same God who had time to hear the cry of his child. It is as though he took and turned his head and his ears so that he could hear the cry of David. He inclined. Now we men, sometimes we become deaf, don't we? Our wives were saying things and we didn't hear it. We didn't hear it. That's by design. Oop, I'm letting out another secret. <laughs> David is saying, he said, I waited patiently on the Lord because the Lord is the only one who can deliver me. He said, he inclined unto me and he heard me. And so when I look at prayer, Hannah said it and she said it best. She poured out her heart to the Lord. And if we will learn to utilize prayer as God designed it, we won't need to pray so fervently in times of trouble because we are accustomed to talking to God. We know that the government attempted to do what? To muzzle Daniel. But Daniel kept his relationship with God because he wasn't fearful of what would happen to him. And here is David in a terrible situation, so it seems. So here he is to God. And he taught us, as the Lord has so taught us as well, you must be patient when you pray. God will answer, but he will answer at his time and on his terms. And sometimes we get that twisted as it were. We want the Lord to hear us and the Lord hears us if we are walking with him, but he may not answer us when we want him to answer us. And so we give up. But the Lord tells us that there is power in our prayer because he said the Lord inclined and the Lord took time to look at our situation as though I am the only one with whom he have a relationship. And that's how great our God is. He cares for you and he cares for me. He can address my needs just like he can address your needs. And sometimes it does. It just blows my mind that if all men on this planet were Christians, the Lord is still as it were big enough, powerful enough, and intelligent enough to address every one of our needs individually. And he does so perfectly. That just blows the mind. So, what power do we have? I have the power if I am walking with God. I have the power through my prayers to do what? To gain the attention of my Father. He goes on to say, not only did he make the petition and not only was he patient, he reveals that he knows that God has the power and only God possesses the power to provide for us. He said in verse two, he brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. David is talking about being delivered from a very dangerous situation. The Lord did something that all of us probably certainly know. He taught his disciples how 
to pray. We parents must teach our children how to pray. There are certain types of prayers and we are familiar with them. I have argued this since I've been preaching. And as I grow older, there is a prayer that should dominate all of our prayers. It's not the supplication. Give me, give me, give me. It is the prayer of thanksgiving. That's the prayer that should dominate my prayer life. When we sit down and start thinking about prayer, you can pray silently. I wasn't making sport of what people sometimes sincere, uh, sincerely and honestly say about prayer. Oh, they took prayer out of the schools. You can pray anywhere you want to pray, brother or sister. You can pray at any time you so desire. Why is that? Because we are to pray without ceasing. There are individuals whose names are in our bulletin. They need our prayers. What must we do? What should we do? Pray for them. We have these young couples in here who are recently married. What are we to do for them? Pray for them. We have elders who have to make very difficult decisions for the congregation. What are we to do for them? Pray for them. We have men in authority, men who make decisions that will impact our lives. The men who have authority, a lot of those individuals don't care about what God says. What are we to do for them? We are to pray for them. The individual families that make up this congregation, what are we to do for them? We are to pray for them. You know, one of the part of the prayer that they call the model prayer, the Lord taught his disciples, give us this day our daily bread. How often do we just you know, go run and get something to eat and don't really give much thought to the fact that God has already provided my needs and then some. Lead us not into temptation. How does God keep us away from temptation? Matthew chapter 4. He gave us the word, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. The word fortifies us. It helps us build up defenses so that we may defeat the devil and we can defeat the devil and so let us conclude with these thoughts if I have a fervent prayer life if I have a fervent love for the brethren I am going to help them when they are in need I'm going to encourage them when they are in dis when they are discouraged and when they are doing good I'm going to praise them jealousy won't lead me to say to criticize, but to what? To praise them. When they are hurting, I am hurting because I love them. And in Acts chapter 4, we studied that somewhere. When Peter and John, after they had been threatened by the same individuals who had the Lord put to death, the Bible says they went to their own company. And what did the entire church do? They lifted up their voice to God. They prayed to God. They put at the feet of God that matter because it was greater than they. And what are we to do sometimes? We are to recognize, I can't control this situation. I'm going to put it in your hands, Lord, and I'm going to leave it there. Why? Because all matters in my life I can't control. And I'm going to put them in his hands. Because he's promised me that he will provide for me. He will look out for me. And he's a father that loves far greater than any father has ever lived. Because he possesses pure love. If you're not saved tonight, we want to encourage you to turn your back on the world and turn to righteousness. John 3, 16, the Lord in his conversation with Nicodemus, what did he say? 
He said, so God so loved the world. There's nothing wrong with expressing your love, God did. That he gave his only begotten son. The Lord teaches us in that verse that your expression of love must be connected to your exhibiting how much you love. And that's what they did in Acts chapter 6. They exhibited their love. They had love and respect for the word of God. This is why they were able to come to a solution. And the church stayed intact because they had love one for another. Then he said God's love has been extended to all men in that same verse. So God loves you enough that he's left behind this plan that we call the plan of salvation. This plan of salvation will allow you to have a relationship with God. This plan of salvation will teach you how to rid yourself of your sins. Luke 13, 3 and 5 says that God requires of every man, every woman, everyone of accountable age and who have the aptitude to understand. He requires of you that you repent of your sins. And then in Romans 10, 9 and 10, the Bible tells us that you must make the good confession. You must admit and confess that you believe with your whole heart that Jesus Christ is the one and only of his kind, the monogonase, the only son of God. And then you must be willing to be baptized in a body or a pool of water for the express purpose of having your sins forgiven. So if you here believe, repent, confess, and are baptized, God then will add you to his church according to Acts 2, 41 and 47. But the Lord tells us that as a new creature, he expects you to walk in the newness of life, Romans 6, 3 and 4. For that very reason, he has left us the Bible to teach us how to get out of sin, how to maintain our relationship with him, and how to overcome the temptations and the trials of life. And so he tells us to comfort one another with these words, 1 Thessalonians 4, 8, 18. So there's nothing in your life that you are experiencing that there is not an answer for in the scriptures. And so we all will face our dark days and our storms. But there's one thing we have, and we should never question the love of God. And if we have the type of love, we aspire to that type of love one for another. You're talking about a mighty force this church could be. And if this church is built upon that foundation, it will stand for generations to come. And so let us think about one another. Let us encourage one another. If we don't know one another as well as we have been had the, 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 the opportunity to get to know each other, let's work on that. Because when they see how much we love each other, when they see that we speak and we speak about the church, we don't speak against it, we speak for it. And then there are problems that every church has to deal with. Mother used to tell us what goes on in my house. Stays in my house. You don't even tell my mother what's going on in my house. So what do we do? We solve our problems in the house because we love one another. So let us build other, each other up in the most holy faith. We're going to ask that Brother Dalton will come forth at this time. And you know the song that has been selected, the invitation song. We're going to stand and sing that song. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, please respond and let us know how we can help you at this time.